if you sand if you have to sand those threads down to level them, do you have to recrown it? Yes. Who said that? Yeah, we're gonna recrown them. Right? And uh, and I'm gonna show you uh, a quick way to crown, depending on how it goes, and then a more in-depth way to crown. I'll show you how um, some what I've taught, been taught that some factories do. And it gives good results and it's quick. And uh, it'll look crude. And then, uh, but in some cases you might want to use it. So I'm gonna take my fret wire. Where's that fender at? The fender's still around? Should be up there. Put it right in front of me. I don't know what my friend Michael has it set at. I'm going to put 9545 in this just because that's what I like. And, uh, is that, how do I say this? Is that, if you played a, 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 a modern day Fender, okay. that, that size wire, not the, not the small frets you see on Fenders, but the next size that they usually use on, on your modern day um, strass and typically. Right, so I'm going to take my fret wire. I want to clean it because it's dirty. And then I got to prep my slot. Those slots are, are, are deep enough for, for my fret wire. Um, I don't have to worry about that. If they weren't, then you're going to want to, you know, again, it's not rocket science. You got to take a saw and you got to make it deeper. And I use a fret saw and it's, I think it's 22 thousandths. What kind of metal is that fret you're talking about? All right, this is nickel and copper. They call it nickel silver, but it's just nickel, <coughs> copper, and zinc. And uh, just a few percents of zinc, 18% nickel, and the rest is copper. Junk silver, isn't that what that is? The German silver too, is that what they call that? Alright, so that's a 20,000 something inch blade. Alright, I want to prep my slot. I know, let's just talk about your slot real quick. Uh, Alright, so looking at the side of the board, here's what a fret slot looks like. We all know what it looks like. So before you put a fret wire in there, Let's take a, a three-corner file and chamfer that edge, that top edge right there. All right, there's two reasons. One, it'll help guide your fret in there. I don't know if you've ever tried to put a fret in there. If you've ever tried and put a fret in, and you're trying to press it in and it flips over to the side, or it's, you're trying to hammer it in and it flips over to the side, that chamfered edge on the top of this fret slot is going to help guide the fret in. The other thing it's going to do is we think frets look like this. And that's how they're always drawn from the side. But what, what frets really are in the manufacturing process looks, looks more like that. So you have this little lip on the side of that fret that if that board sometimes is a really hard wood, that it'll want to keep that off of the board because that board can't, so it'll end up taking off like that and then it'll sit down and it'll give you some issues. <laughs> that's that's one of the problems of the mission right there. Yeah. <laughs> now the other thing it does, it's just common courtesy for the next guy because you've got a fret that comes in, you know, in this shape like that. And you have these barbs that stick into the side. Well, when this barb comes out, if that wood's elevated it's hot, it'll, it'll make that chip out real bad. But if it's chamfered a little bit, it's got a little bit of meat there. It's actually taken off from down here and all this kind of supports it. Does that make sense? Yeah. It, it, helps, it helps to prevent you, but it's not always going to do that. And, but it, it does help. So we're going to just slightly chamfer those edges. And I use a little three-point file. You can use any three, small three-point file. You can use a... Uh, um, I don't know. I'm just going to I took it, uh, it's short, and 
I kind of ground down the edge. I do this with, with binding on too, so I'd be working a short file, kind of like that, chamfering that edge. Can you do your left hand? Hmm? Your left hand, can you just move it out of the way? Oh. No, why are you doing it? You want oh, to move the see hand it? that was holding Yeah. Oh, I see. So we can. So with this. And are you putting much pressure on that, or are you just letting the file do this thing? Um, most of the file, I'm going to put a little bit of pressure because I don't want it to slide out and go across the board. Can you pass that file around? You're done. Yeah. And if you didn't have all of us in here asking you questions, how long would this take you usually? I don't know, because all day at work I got people asking questions. <laughs> this is, you know. This goes back to what we was talking about. In an eight hour day, I usually do four hours worth of work. So at your kitchen table, you can get this one done pretty quick. I, I can do, it's amazing. My, my kids are not in a daycare anymore. My job was to get them up every morning, take them to daycare, make sure, you know, because my wife had to be at school. And uh, so I wasn't getting to the shop until close to 10 o'clock. And then this year was the first year that both of my kids went to uh, um, uh, school. Maddie started kindergarten, so they're both in the same elementary school. So they just, I pack my kids up, put them in my wife's van, and they're gone by 6.45. And, uh, and then I don't, really open up the shop until 10. And in that amount of time, I mean, I'll just get in the car right then. I can literally do a full day's work before 10 o'clock. And so now from 10 until, you know, 4, 30, 5 o'clock, I, I, I don't have that anxiety anymore. I can, if somebody comes in, I can talk to them about their guitar. I can, you know, help them through whatever crisis they've got going on, listen to stories about their, you know, uh, you know, my, my brother-in-law's a musical genius. You know, tell me all about it. You know, the first guitar he ever bought. All those guitars that got away. I used to own a Stradivarius, but I can't believe I pawned it. <laughs> so. Yeah, so that's Antique Pro Show was good for that kind of stuff. <laughs> yeah. And then Jim will show up and we'll hang out with him for a little while. He makes us drop everything. <laughs> so now you got like 16 more, right? And see, Bob adds a whole new level to that. Yeah. Well, yeah, Bob is on the Bob show all day long. Yeah. Hey, Jason, why are you doing that? Tell me a quick story about that uh, guitar they found in Texas. That guy at that uh, garage sale, that Gibson, that old Gibson. Which one? The one where they bought it like for ten dollars. Oh, that was the Nick Lucas. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Spin that story real fast. That yeah. Was... So, well, the guy that brought it in wasn't uh, the guy. The guy that brought it in paid a lot of money for it. He paid five grand for it, and this is needs you know two thousand dollars worth on top of that, two to three thousand dollars. The guy who bought it originally, you know, after uh, my friend bought it from him. He goes, yeah, I mean, I'll be honest with you. I was just at a, a, a garage sale and I was sitting there and I thought it was, I mean, it says Gibson on it, but it was all beat up. I figured it was worth it. <laughs> John said, well, how much did you pay for me? I think I gave him $10 for it. <laughs> <laughs> someone had an aneurysm problem? <laughs> what did John, John pay for that? They don't know John. What, what, what? Uh, I think John paid five or six grand for it. Which was a good deal. What model was it? Or? It was the first year Nick Lucas. Um, Educate me. Who was Nick Lucas? Well, Nick Lucas was a guitar player. The Gibson made the Nick Lucas models, uh, and the first <coughs> one was kind of a, a crazy, goofy, you know, bridge. It had an A-frame bracing. It's a real deep body. So uh, you've got all these people that are just fans of those guitars. Um, it kind of turned into the uh, to more of a L double O shape, but with a thick body. And uh, but this just happened to be the, the first year of that of that guitar. It didn't take off, but the people who want them they want to collect them. And that was a tough one. I 
you know, you don't know what you're going to find in a pair where you know, Gibson has a dovetail joint just like, like Martin does. And, uh, but if you ever do a vintage Gibson, don't naturally assume that it's going to, the, the uh, dovetail is going to be what you think it is. I mean, the early ones, they cut the dovetail out with a bandsaw. So they go all the way to the back. The dovetail doesn't have a pocket in the bottom like, a, like, like we saw on this Martin, or like you see on these Martin kits. It's gonna go from the top to the back because they would take uh, the block and just hold it up, turn the table on a bandsaw, and just saw into it. And then the, and the saw marks are still there. They didn't like face off the, the back end of that dovetail. It's just, I mean, it's just, it's fun. <laughs> I love I love how it gives because I never know what I'm gonna find. Um, but it's crazy and then it's sloppy. And I don't take that stuff out, I leave it so the next guy can enjoy it. And um plus it's original. But that means that the back is glued directly to that. There's no bottom pocket. So when you're steaming you have to be careful because that steam goes transfers to the back and the bottom of the block and then your guitar just starts to fall apart. Of course, you guys put it back together, but it's, it, it makes it harder to get the neck out. And then the dirty tricks that you don't see is guitars like that Nick Lucas wasn't going to be, a, that was the first prototypes of that year, so they weren't manufacturing them. So they're having some guy, obviously, at the factory design it. So, and he's building it. And this is the only thing I can imagine. You know, I've seen this on a few years You're trying to sting that neck out, it won't come out. And you're like, what is going on? Everything's loose. The whole thing's, you know, going. Well, what they did was they put the sides and back together. Then they slid the neck into the dovetail joint without a fingerboard. Then they put the top on with no exit point from the top. So the top is completely sealed over the dovetail. And then they glued the fingerboard on across the whole thing. So you have a section of the top that's over the dovetail. It's not going to let you take it out. So, well, if you suspect that you have one of those, then what you would do in that situation is, because everybody should, if you got a, if you got a guitar, you get, get, if you want to do an X set, go get a harmony. I mean, they're put together with high glue. They're, the old harmonies are awesome guitars because they're built um, quick. And it's usually just the geometry that's off on those guitars. And, and they don't sound very good in most cases, although the sovereigns do. But I mean, some of my favorite guitar players and recordings are like Lightning Hopkins, Robert Johnson. If you listen to Lightning Hopkins, you'll hear how poorly his guitar is set up. You can hear him struggle with getting the notes all the way down. So he's obviously got a high action, but then when he gets up the neck, you can hear it spank out. So you, you, you can just picture him playing on the neck that is too, super bowed. And the tone of the guitar is usually not that great because he probably bought it from Sears. He doesn't know, or a catalog, it's a harmony or a silver tone. But when you hear it, that becomes the tone. And so I like that boxy tone. And, uh, and, and I like those, especially our, you know, like that D&D &D in there, the, the, the art shop. You know, that's going to be an inexpensive art shop of the day. But it is going to be a super cool guitar when that guitar sticks up. And, uh, it's going to sound cool. It'll have a sound all its own. And, uh, all right, I'm going to get back to what I'm doing. How did I even get off on that tangent? How did you let me do that? <laughs> Jim Soul. Oh, Jim, I'm a story. We're going to end up like yesterday where I don't do anything. We just talk. <laughs> okay. Cleaning the front wire. You want the nap? The nap. <coughs> Who sees it? Like your buddy man. Which hand? Right there. Yes. In our shop, we do this. We just always yell someone's name. I'll go, Bob, Michael, I can't find someone's And then it's literally like that. It's, like, oh, it's here. <laughs> they do it too. You know. Is Bob building anything these days? Um, he's not building Constantine as much anymore. Um, People want them, but they take so long to build that we have this problem when we get so busy with repair work, you know, it's, it's hard to stop and build anything. And then, so that's a, that's a you know, I got myself in trouble taking two years worth of banjo work at one 
point. I was just like, whoa, I'm really underquoted those banjos, <laughs> but I've got to finish them out. So, um, you know, I'd switch over to building what I want and then sell them. That means you build a lot less because if you're not under a gun, you don't get it done. I mean, but there's no money in building, that's for sure. Hmm. Okay. So I'm just pushing this through. I don't know what I'm doing. I don't use this one. This is the first time I've ever used this. Uh, it doesn't have a crank. Michael told me you just push it through. But it's a cool design because it wouldn't be hard to build. Because these are just skateboard bearings, I imagine. Um, this one's got a washer between the two bearings. For the tank. Uh, for your tank. Yeah, for the tank. And on the back, they've just milled out a, like a keyhole slot. And then you've got an Allen wrench that you can control how far up and down. I just showed that through to see what would happen. So we got a much bigger, much tighter radius than we're going to need. But we'll fix that. He did recommend bend the end before you push it through, otherwise you're going to shove it through your hand. Or your <laughs> so apparently he had an accident with it. But I thought that was a genius little thing, especially if you were, you know, it doesn't take up much room. The one I've got at the shop is it's just, it takes us tons and tons of room, and it's ancient. Bob, Bob had it when I first met him. I've never bought one because I've always had the luxury of just one being around. He doesn't like to do fret work, so he doesn't do it. Use it. I'm going to bend this out just a tad bit. I, don't, I, I want it over bent than the 12 radius, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to work with it. I, I, I want to, and I don't always do this, but it's recommended to, when you put your fret wire in, we've got an over radius. And I don't know exactly how much, I just over radius a little bit. Because when I hammer that fret in or squeeze it, I picture the, the fret wire going in and then when you press the center down those barbs that went in are going to go in to a certain point and then slide it over just a tad bit it helps to lock it into the slide in theory uh, if you notice old fenders they don't have much issue with frets coming up on the side of their fingerboards because fender didn't put their frets in from the top Fender slid their frets in from the side up until like 1980. Oh, so if you Charvel. ever have to, what'd you say? Did Charvel do that too? They may have, I don't know. I don't know about Charvel. I'm, that's good to know if you've heard something like that. Hard stories, but I don't know. I've never free fretted a Charvel, I don't think. So I will be cautious of that. My buddy, my, I think years ago, tried to pull frets out. It was just a disaster. Ripped the board up. So I had to pull one of those. Yeah, that's the problem. When you got to pull one of those, there's no exit. There was no entry point of the tank, so there's no exit point either. It's got wood on top of it, a slide that had never been chamfered or anything, <clears throat> and it's going to want to blow out everywhere. So you want to, uh, and you can't do this on every one of them because some of them are bound, and then some of them are so lacquered in, like the '70s, that it's almost impossible to get the frets to slide because it's you know. So what you would do is I'd take a little Dremel tool, um, like a little, you know, with a tiny little bit. I just need to make a, like a dental, you know, with a round head and make a little bitty uh, notch on the side of the fret. And then I just take a punch, um, like a, a, a nail set, you know, that you would set uh, trim nails or whatever it's called, finishing nails. I put it on the edge of that, kind of seats in that little hole, you know, to help it from sliding off. And I tap it with a hammer, and then it'll start to move. You'll start to see it slide over. And once it gets about that far, they put them in from the base side. Then you can grab it with your with the pair of pliers, and then put your finger on there and kind of just push down on it and just pull it out. And you know, it'll come out. Then you can thread it from the top because the next guy who frets it may not know, you know, that. Uh, and he may try to pull it out from the top. At least that way, he, the next guy won't end up messing up a board and having a mess on his hands. Or the next girl, leave the women out. Um, so, with that said, that's a quick tutorial on 
fenders in case one of you go home and say, I'm going to pull the frets out of my vintage fender and replace it. Now, when I bend fret wire, I go ahead and take my, my cutoffs and I go ahead and clip both ends because those aren't bent and they'll cause you problems and you'll forget and you'll pick up your wire and you'll go to the other side, you know, when you're fitting the fret wire. So, we can go ahead and pre cut some wire. Hmm. You, you can do it one at a time or do you? Do you can do them one at a time. Uh, I like to mix it up, you know, it makes my day exciting. So sometimes I'll, I'll go ahead and pre cut everything and prep everything and then put them in. Um, sometimes I'll do them one at a time. I usually try to uh, uh, monitor the situation by putting in one, 12, and five, because that's where my gauge works from. So, so I can kind of monitor, see how much pushback I'm getting, uh, and then go in between from there. And then if everything's going well, it's fine. Just give me a little bit of pushback. I know I got a double action rod. Um, if, if something, if I feel like I'm getting too much, then I'm gonna shave the barbs off the tang, or I'm gonna flatten it with that, with that, uh, what is that tool I have? Jim, give it back to me. Maybe I try to squeak, compress these, the, the barbs with that side of it. Now, when you squeeze this, it, it, flat, it straightens out the radius, you know? So if you know you're gonna have to, to have a fret and you try to put one in and it's like, okay, it's, it's, it's still spongy in the center or I'm gonna to have to expand it, you're gonna definitely wanna overbend your wire because the more compression you put in here to, to expand it, it's going to uh, flatten out your radius. The other thing is if you needed to shave it off, let's say you got the tongue of, a, of an acoustic guitar and you don't wanna just pound on it and I'm going to say this to, again with arch tops because there's nothing worse than refretting an arch top guitar and you hit that tongue and then you get the guitar strung up and then all of a sudden you get this buzz in this, in this arch top and you figure out from tapping that top and beating on it, the bass bar came loose. And so there's not, it's tough to glue a bass bar through an F hole. <laughs> so in a lot of cases you just have to take it off. Sometimes you'll get lucky and like I did, and it's got a pickup hole and it came loose right at the top. So those, ever since I've made that mistake, I shave all the barbs off the, off the tang and, and press them in and shave them to the, to the fingerboard and glue them. And, uh, and so a tool to do that with, you can buy, but I made mine. I took a aluminum block, Cut a slot in it on a bandsaw with a wooden bandsaw blade, <laughs> and uh, and then went down to the store and bought a file. And when you make a file, just like I made this one, that's just a file that's like uh, like the one that I use with a handle on it. That first step uh, file. Yeah, yeah, that one that uh, I was showing you earlier. You take the file, you clamp it to a vise, put a rag over it, and then you can hit it with a mallet and it'll snap it and maybe a little jagged and then you can, uh, yeah. then you can file it off. It's tough to cut through a file. I mean, yeah, somebody else may know a good way to do it. Jason, you mentioned cutting the barbs off. Uh-huh. How, how do you cut the yeah, barbs off? Yeah, this is that tool I was showing you. Oh, okay. So that's a, it's the same thing. I went down to the hardware store and bought a file, broke it off in a couple of pieces. I ground an arch into the top here. Now I've got a feeler gauge, tiny little feeler gauge inside there. You can get this feeler gauge set at the auto store. I just bought a new set of it. So then I got all these, these gauges. I can, I can put this in here. I've got a set screw that I drilled and tapped. I can drop that in there and put those, a feeler gauge in there and get a certain width. Huh. And I clamp it into a Device. I wasn't prepared for this, but it's 
So, for example, if one of us are refretting an acoustic guitar, uh -huh. like you said, we don't want to pound on the. Yeah, you can, but you need to invest into into one of these. And so this slides into the, the, the sound hole of the guitar, and this part here presses up underneath the fingerboard, and all this weight, I mean, it, it weighs a lot. And all that weight is like just as, it absorbs all the shock. But for example, like to me, for example, I know I'm never gonna play above where the neck meets the body uh -huh. on an acoustic guitar, but rarely, rarely. I'm not saying I would never do it, but it's rarely. I know what you want me to say. Just leave the frets out. <laughs> <laughs> but you could use that, that same technique where you're not necessarily concerned with. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you just press them in. Just a little yeah, bit. just take, shave the things off and press them in and glue yeah. them in. Um, uh, I may decide to shave the tangs on this. I'd rather shave the tangs than uh, widen the slide, you know, because. The fingerboard is going to survive a lot longer than the fret, so we may as well conserve the fingerboard instead of uh, you know making things wider and wider. Because the next time it gets refretted, the slots may get widened a little bit, and the next time, and the next time. So we'll see how this frets. Ebony is you know is tough. You just put it in there. I usually hold it with a pair of pliers, which I don't think I brought in. Now, I got a of those if you want. What? I got a needle of those if you want. Yeah, I might need those, not right now, but I might need them later, like if we resize this tank. But you see what I'm doing, I'm just pulling it through. And I'm gonna wanna, and then they'll start to disappear. And they'll get smaller. And maybe I just wanna take a little bit off to help it fit, fit in a uh, slide a little bit better. Uh, but I wanna do that when it's flat. Because it's hard when it's curved and it just starts to bend the wire. So when it's flat, you know, so like I've already bent that piece of wire. I I don't mind when I'm doing a fret job if I end up wasting wire. It should be wasteful, but I mean, if, if the other day I, I cut I cut everything for a guitar and then you know really thought about it and, and then just decided I, I wanted to change the wire for the guy. I was like, you know what, this is going to be too short for him. And then I just put that somewhere else, save it for something else if I can ever use it. And, so it's better to use and do the job the best you can and if you waste wire. So in other words, when you order from fret wire to do something, order extra. Because you're probably gonna need it. So we'll go down this board. I'll go ahead and prep this wire. You always cut yours first. Hmm? You always cut your wire first. Uh, rather than just hammering it in then cut it. Uh, yeah, yeah, because uh, I'm usually using a, uh, a handheld fret press. And how, how proud are they from each side, from the basic fret side? Proud enough to where you can get in there and cut it. Okay. You know, it doesn't have to be that long. Now I'm gonna I'm gonna do something different when we when we pull out this tailor. Yeah. <laughs> oh, what? They're making fun of me, Jason. I've ordered those tools as you're talking to us. <laughs> Jim's got one of those nice workshops where you have to take your shoes off before you go. <laughs> I'm envious. All right. More wire, I want more wire. It's in there. <coughs> you order fret wire by the foot? Or do they just come in batches? Uh, you, can, you can order it in, in links like this from Stumac. Uh, most, you, you don't have to buy a whole pound. I just always buy it by a pound. Oh, okay. like if you came in and you had some odd wire that you wanted, I would just go ahead and order a pound of it. That way I would have it next time. Now, if I wasn't doing this for a living, that would be insane. Yeah. You know, so you just want to order a certain amount of pieces. And then that's how I kind of collect fret wire. And then if I've got a fret wire that I don't like to use or whatever, people will come in and they'll, you know, 
wanted to build like a cigar box or whatever. And I just either sell that stuff to them for cheaper because mm -hmm. they usually don't care um, what kind of fret wire or guys that are making like lap steels. If it's a fret wire I don't particularly like to use or it's really odd. But that doesn't matter because they're not going to be using the fret stimulator, they're going to be markers. So now we find a way to get rid of it somehow or use it for something. It's right next to your tape, isn't it? Uh, I think that was the 8040. Oh, you're right. 9545. I don't want to make a mistake with that. There's two different kinds of there. Have you done that before? No, I would catch it pretty quick. But there's a first for everybody. <laughs> Remember one day Bob, Bob was standing there and he goes, what, what's wrong with this? And I was like, what do you mean? And I was like, the nut you made is beautiful. I mean, it looks great. He goes, just look at it. And I was like, I don't see it. It looks wonderful. He goes, well, I didn't see it either. And, I was, <laughs> and then finally he goes, count the slots. And I was like, one, two, three, four, five. Five. <laughs> <laughs> he he evenly spaced five slots across there. He didn't notice until he started getting strings on it. Because you know, because well, it's it's like that. You know, if you've ever seen painters or whatever, they're like they're trying to paint a word or, or do something, and they step back and you're like, oh, I didn't spell it right. Because <laughs> you're focused on something else other than you know what's actually going on. And focusing on carving a nut perfect and making all the edges and everything. And I just thought that was funny. It was, right in um, front of you. There it is. I'm glad y'all are here. I'm glad I'm not by myself today. <laughs> so what's the purpose of doing that, getting the manufacturing grease off the... Yeah, yeah. It, it's pretty dirty. You, you don't see it. I see all the black that came off of that. I don't think I've ever done that. I'm going to start. And, uh, yeah. Well, it's only an issue if you if you if you're trying to glue it and then it won't stick to the uh, yeah. to the fret wire. I'm not going to need glue on this. I say that, but I'm about to do a fretting style that I never do, except because I'm trying to uh, do it slightly different. Because I want someone to be able to fret a guitar without very many tools. And then we can get into the bigger tools when we start doing the, the tailor. <laughs> but I don't want someone going home and saying, I don't want to try this because I don't want to spend $300 on a handle fret press. You don't need a $300 handle fret press. <laughs> you do if you got a shop that you have to take your shoes off then. <laughs> Did, are you ordering ones yet? I just canceled the order. <laughs> <laughs> I got, did I tell you that I got uh, another one of these, the Stu Mac ones? Um, it was on eBay and the guy was selling it for 125 bucks. That's a deal. I know. I didn't even need one. I said I'm buying it. For right. $308. Yeah. Um, give me about 50 times. Yeah, I give you one. <laughs> I want to be able to fret it twice as fast. Two handed fret presses. Double fisting fret presses. No, it comes in handy to have two. It really does. Because you know, like right now, if I were to press these in, I'm going to press them in with a with a with a call that's a little more. Um, I mean that since this is 12, I'm going to press it. I would press it in at like a uh, like a 10, and then I would go back and press the center in. At 12 or maybe a nine and a, a nine and a half that way it pushes the fret wire down like I go in I'm gonna press the ends in first and then press the center in now I'm not gonna do that with a fret press we're gonna see how well this happens with a uh, let me see where I'm at I want my 12 and 5 so would you put your dots in first before you did yeah that? you want to put your dots in before this okay but I'm not I'm gonna put my dots in second but you want to put your dots in first what if you're doing something would you put your inlays in, even if they're not dots, before you radius it, or after you radius it? Uh, your inlay work? Yeah. Well, I mean, I've, I've had to put inlays into a, a pre-radius board, um, mm -hmm. and that's kind of good, because then you can gauge, you know, work your uh, pearl, because you wouldn't want to put a bunch of pearl in there and then radius it and then burn through your pearl. 
So then you can kind of decide with your layout. Mm -hmm. Is that, if, as it comes down, do I use one big piece or do I make that into multiple pieces so I can make my, you know, it depends on how thick your pearl is. Yeah. Uh, and then you gotta pay attention to when you have to plane board, mm -hmm. how you can kind of guesstimate how thick your pearl is. Because um, you may want to pull the pearl or the plastic, you know, um, whatever it, whatever it may be. So, but you can do most. I mean, if you're doing a lot of pearl work, you're going to want to pull the frets. But if you're doing dots, you can work within that parameter. Yeah. And that's my plan because I don't know what I want to put in this. Probably not big dots at all. Michael told me that he looked this up for the class. Michael was going to be here today to help out, but he wasn't able to make it. Um, and Michael works at the shop with me a couple days a week. He's an ER nurse. So he's a what? He's an ER nurse by trade. And then comes in and helps around the shop because he's really good at what he does. It working on guitars. Um, daytime jobs. Yeah, he's smart. He's got a real job. And uh, so I imagine right now being an ER nurse is insane. So he's probably not like, having got work. They put them all on their emergency plans. So. All the hospitals. Yeah. I'm gonna go ahead and go up to 12. This is what my block that I bought for a neck rocker that I never used for a neck rocker. It comes in handy. I got all my stuff drilled into it. I'm gonna go with with a one, 12, and five first. So we can just uh, monitor this as we go. See what we want to do. And I'm okay if it gives me a little back bow. What I have noticed is that in what's going on with the, the telly, the, the, one, the guitar I pulled out earlier was playing. That was one I built. And so I finished it a year ago. And I think I had to force a little relief into there because I had to press the frets out and and I was okay with that, so I forced a little relief into it. Now what I noticed after a year of it sitting around, because I didn't have it forever, the Alabama Arts Council had it for, I don't know, three or four months, and then it sat around the shop, demoed around there for a while. Now I got a high action, so now I think the neck has settled and it's coming the other way. But see, with a double action rod, you can control it. So if I get a lot of backbone in this, I know I can somewhat control that, and then probably once this whole thing settles in, it's going to go. I've also haven't carved the back of the neck yet. So the neck is going to be real stiff right now. Um, so I'm going to be okay with, you know, some of this back bow. It's just not used to fretting this style. So I want to do this because these are sandbags. So let's say you've got that neck that you got to refret. You can lay that across some sandbags, even if it was attached to the body. You'll be able to take a beam, come up with a beam to, to level your, your uh, frets, and, uh, and then you can get some calls and you can hammer these in. You can go straight hammer. I would not recommend it. I've never been good at fretting that way. Your hammer's in front of your thing? Oh, yeah. You go straight hammer. We're not. We're going to go with our calls. Now I've got these brass calls, and you can buy brass calls just on their own. And they look, look like that. These came with my fret press, but you can buy them. You can have a drill press. This would be perfect for a drill press scenario. They, you can look, put these into a, a, a tool that goes up into your drill press and you can use your drill press to press them in. Mm -hmm. And especially if it's flat, you can even build a call if this is rounded for that to go in there and you can press them in. I've never done it that way. Um, let me see how hard this is. 
Sandbags are great. I just went to Mark's Outdoor and bought some sandbags a long time ago. I need some new ones. So we got a 12 inch radius on this. So what I'm gonna do first is, that's a six, I'm not gonna use it. Don't need a 14, and I'm gonna need 12. I'm not gonna use 16, seven and a quarter, nah. 10 maybe, nine five most likely, 20. So when I put my nine five on there, I can see where the ends of it's gonna really seat good right on the edge of my board. And then when I'm done pounding that in with this, I'm gonna go back with my 12 and then seat it. So, so you do the outsides first with the 9.5 mm -hmm. and then the inside. And what I'm trying to accomplish is the tangs go in and then when I hit the center, it knocks them out and then and hopefully slides them a little bit. Um, and I'm hoping that that's not gonna cause any problems for somebody because I've chamfered the top edge, you know, when they pull it out. You start with 12? I'm sorry, I'm gonna start with 12. I'm going to start with nine and a half. Okay. And I'm going to do the first fret first. And I'm going to gate, see what I think about this whole thing. This one I can just put straight in the board. And then I'm going to switch up. Put some uh, glues and stuff in. I'm going to hold the size. Don't hit your fingers. You will. Trouble with the issues with the fret rocking when you're putting it in. Oh, that's why I changed that edge. It makes a big difference, and uh, yeah, I mean a huge difference, especially if you're using like mandolin size wire. I would use that a lot on banjos, the, the 53 wide, yeah. you know, those old vintage looking stuff. Um, and when you when you're using that nine point five, are you still just hitting the outside, or are you going all the whole? I'm going along the whole thing. And are you using the brass side of that hammer, or the? Uh -huh. Are you using the brass side of that hammer, or the other one? The. Uh, yeah, the I'm using the brass side yeah. of the hammer. What is the other side? Is that like brass? And that I was talking. I, I drove that in at a twelve. Oh, no, I mean, it looks good. <laughs> now I'm going to draw the. I found this one in at nine point five. What'd you say? I said, what's the other side of the hammer? Like, what would you use? This is some sort of uh, it's what they used to put on these hammers. Now they have some orange tip. I like this one. I keep grinding them off. I'm going to have to replace this hammer at some point. Well, maybe I can just find another one of these. These are screwed. I'm finding this hammer because I think I told you all yesterday. My wife was this one. Back when we first started dating, we were kids. I guess we were adults. But. What if you put that call inside the little, the little holder you put it in, like on a drill press or on that, those clamps, mm -hmm. and hit the top of that? I know, I want to try that. I don't own one of those calls, okay. or one of the, the holders. Uh, I thought about that, and I thought about, hey, I should invent, you know, ones that, that are beefier and, and have more mass and cut them out. But then I kept thinking, well, you only have the option to hit in the center. Sometimes it's nice to move over to the side. Almost so, been one of these, right? What been? Just about. Yeah, yeah. I almost do that. But then I think what would be better is if it was just a longer, a taller piece of brass so you got your fingers out of the way. Yeah. yeah. Just, you know. Um, but this works great for me. I, I, and I do this over the tongue. This is how I put them in because I can't press. There are tools that you can have to press over a tongue, but. Huh? Does that flatten the top of the crown out, or does it even matter? Because you're going to go back over. Yeah, it's not really flattening it. You know, it, it it's, would be even less than if I was using an actual hammer. Um, it's got some crown into that. Yeah, yeah, this has got a, uh, oh. it's got a crown. I did. Here, I'm going to pass some of these around. I forgot all about that. I'm just using something. I'm just to, you know, I've got to call me out on that now. If you don't know what's going on. You switch to the 12 on that? Yeah. 
Switched over to the 12. What are you looking for when you're looking at? I'm just looking to make sure it's seated. Seeing if I can see any like major gaps or anything. What do you call those Fred Sears or whatever? What do you call those tools? You're using? Uh, these yeah. um, fret pressing calls. I, I believe it's what you call. If you look, yeah, C A U L S. I've said calls my whole life, and I, I don't even know if that's the correct term for anything. Anything that I've, I've put on top of something else, the clamp or the hammer on, I always call it a call. <laughs> Back on these trick kill numbers, right? He'll say Thank from eleven dollars, and it means one of those. You get there and they're all yeah. the other equipment. Yeah, it's like you know the eleven dollars of screw that holds it in. Wow, <laughs> <laughs> I know. Yeah, that's way more Files. But... All right, so I'm putting these three yeah. in. No glue, nothing. We will uh, we'll glue these in a different way. Trying to drive both those edges in at the same time as possible. Jason Lunch is here whenever you're ready. To break. Whenever y'all ready. Yeah, I think we're heated, so yeah, be better. Yeah, yeah. If they're warm, let's go ahead and eat.